Welcome to Agatha Christie, She Watched, our spoiler-heavy look at the movie and TV adaptations of the mystery genre's greatest writer. I'm Bill Peschel of Peschel Press, publishers of the annotated novels of Agatha Christie, and today we'll be talking about deconstructing doctors, disobedient daughters, and dying detectives. It's Curtain, the 2013 Poirot episode starring David Suchet as Hercule Poirot. But first, let me introduce my partner in marriage, as well as crime of the fictional kind, Teresa. How are you doing today? Hi, Bill. It's always such a pleasure to be here with you in your little office under the stairs. And at last, we come to the end of Hercule Poirot's career. It's been a long, strange trip. 20 years. They started filming in 1993, and they got almost everything. And here we are with Curtin. And I have to say, I'm <laughs> ready to move on to different sets of Agatha Christie films because we, we watched everything differently than um, a lot of people did because of course we've watched all of the Poirot adaptations within the last year and, and we've really actually only been watching the Agatha Christie adaptations since the second half of I think it was 2020 because by then I was able to go back to the library again but I'm really not sure. We did record the times and the adventure of the Clapham Cook we saw in March of 2021. So we are talking a year and a half. 18 months and we've seen all of the Poirot episodes intermixed with all of the rest of them. I was thinking about when we actually started the Agatha project and I think that was in 2020 with we watched the secret of chimneys because you were doing the annotation of the secret of chimneys and there's an amazing amount folks of material in our annotated version of the secret of chimneys that was october of 2020 was it then that's right october 24th because you included the date every time you uh, gave me a review so next month will be the two-year anniversary of this project <laughs> Gosh. And I guess it was around 2020 that I brought home from the library Crooked House. That was before the project officially began. Officially began. Yeah. That was September, September 19th of 2020 of 2020. So, so seven, seven days from now, seven days from now will be exactly two years. The, uh, we fell into this project folks, because I was looking for a movie to watch and I knew that we liked mysteries. And there it was at the front of the display rack at the library, Glenn Close in Crooked House. And I thought, Oh, we like mysteries. We like Agatha Christie. We should watch this. And one thing led to another, and we started watching more. And then Bill decided, you know, maybe the re I I need well, to write were, reviews. I started writing reviews for you the started website. Writing reviews because you wrote a review for Crooked House, which we published, and for the website to encourage traffic to the website. I did a few more, and then you said, you know, maybe we should. <laughs> maybe we should make a book out of this, <laughs> this. because you kept doing a review because you did a review for Secret of Chimneys because I was working on the project. Project and I might have, I think maybe by two or three at some point, it just kind of like, because this is the way I always work on things. This is how I got Writers Gone Wild published because I was writing individual essays for the website. And, and it an, turned into a book. And it turned into a book. So Not that, nearly as complicated a book as this. <laughs> uh, well, it was complicated in its own way, but this is, this is something really amazing when it, we get it out. Yes, it will be. And here we are two years Almost two years to the day after we got started, my goodness, with Curtin, Poirot's last case. It was not the last Agatha Christie ever published. That was Sleeping Murder. And it is not the last book that she wrote because she wrote this in the early 40s during the Blitz. She wanted to make sure that she had a... Two books. Nest, she, wrote, she wrote It and Sleeping Murder. She wanted to be sure that she had nest eggs for the family so that something could come out and provide them with a lump of money. One of the things that I was looking for when we sat down to watch Curtin was, of course, we had watched, I believe it was Murder by the Book, it was a really interesting little show done in the mid-80s. It was a less than an hour. It was clear Agatha Christie had a dream in which Hercule Poirot, played by Ian Holmes, showed up at her front door and had a lengthy conversation with her, an argument, really, about why didn't she love him and what was she going to do with him? And she told him, oh, you know, I don't want to do to you what they did to poor James Bond. So I have to kill you. Characters don't like being killed when they become real. But there were things in that one hour episode that I was looking for in Curtain because you see the spinning tables. You see the spinning tables in Murder by the Book. And there we are, Captain Hastings 
turns the table. It's a circular bookcase table and there are two coffee cups on it. And he turns it around. And of course, they're identical coffee cups and there's nothing on the table to say it's been turned around if there's nobody to see him doing it. And we saw that in Murder by the Book. They set that up to like give Agatha the idea to do this in Curtain. And there were a whole lot of threads in that little episode that referred to Curtain. And I was looking forward to seeing it and I was not disappointed. All of those little bits were there and they really followed the text of the novel very closely. And yes, Judith really would tell you that oh, really? You're going to have a baby who might be compromised in some way? Like with Down syndrome, you should abort right away. Or you should have that baby exposed on the hillside right away because he just won't have the same quality of life as a decent, normal person. Judith would be a eugenist. You know it. So would that oh, Dr. Was. Franklin. Yeah. Dr. Franklin, in, in the novel, goes ahead and says, oh, we should get rid of sickly people. Uh, he actually says somewhere in the novel that he would remove something like 80% of the population on Earth if he had his choice. And I read that and I thought, oh, my God, this is how you end up with heaps of bodies. And then you have to develop a new underclass because of the 20% that Dr. Franklin would allow to live. Who is going to go out there in the fields and grow the food? And who is going to be cleaning his toilets and washing his laundry and cooking his meals? Because you can be sure it's not going to be him. But that was very much in the air in the 1940s, oh 1920s, 30s, and 40s. It's appalling reading what Judith and Dr. Franklin have to say. Our villain really takes advantage of it, pushing them, urging them ever so cleverly to become even more extreme in their viewpoints until hopefully one or the other will look at Dr. Franklin's useless, worthless, non-contributing to society, invalid wife and say, you know, the right thing to do for her own good, of course, would be to kill her gently, softly. She would just go to sleep and never wake up. And she does die, but she doesn't go to sleep gently and not wake up. No, no. it's an agonizing death. <laughs> Let's go back to the beginning because we have Poirot, who is, you know, his age has finally caught up to him at 127 or so. <laughs> well, this is actually set in 1949. We see a little, uh, we see a note oh. written to somebody and, and there's an actual date. And you have to assume that he's got to be in his 80s and he is ailing. He is sick. He's in a wheelchair. He has serious heart trouble. You see him taking little ampules of amyl nitrate. An amyl nitrate. Aren't those poppers? Yes, they are stimulants. You sm snort one and your heart will speed up. And, and that's, that's why point. he's taking them? That's why he's taking them. Yes, he has. It's an irregular heartbeat. It's a faltering heartbeat. So he needs a stimulant like brandy. Only this is much more direct. Brandy's not a stimulant. Well, I know that we watched we them went, give brandy we went to heart this patients in this styles is what, and thought, this is, what on earth? Read the book, folks. Read and read complete annotated <laughs> mysterious affair styles. styles from Peschel Press, fifteen ninety five at your local bookstore. We had our children read it, and they were all uniformly horrified at the thought of you give strychnine to heart patients as a as a stimulant. You give brandy to to dying people. They were just horrified, absolutely horrified. So, okay, so he's, so anyway, getting back to Curtin, so Poirot is taking these little ampules, ampules that I guess they're like little glass, they, they, they looked like they were made of paper, they look like little paper sachets, but obviously they weren't because amyl nitrate must be a gas, right? Right. So you have to break it, it's either, a, it must be, hopefully safely, a form of plastic. I don't know if they had plastic back in 1940 for amyl nitrate, but it would be that or thin glass in a, in a cloth casing. Oh, yes, it would be in a cloth casing. That would make sense because it looked, it did not look like it was plastic or glass to me. But he, he held it right up underneath his, underneath his nose and snapped it and breathed in, struggling to breathe, gasping for air. But the reason why he's there at Styles, which has fallen on hard times, the family sold it and moved on. And I have to say, too, Styles did not look like what I remembered from 
the Mysterious Affair at Styles. The building looked kind of different to me, but it's been a while since we saw the Mysterious Affair at Styles. So but we I, looked it up. It's a different building. So it is they a different building. They it's, didn't go back to the original building. It's I guess not it my imagination so. that along with everything else changing, Styles was completely rebuilt from the foundations. <laughs> yeah. But I was thinking that he was actually going into something like a rest home, and it turned out not to be the case. He's basically he's just taking rooms in this mansion. Yeah, the the Styles was bought. Styles was sold by the family, and it was bought. It ended up in the hands of the Luttrells, Toby and Daisy, who are an older couple. Apparently, they have no children. It's surprising how many people in Agatha Christie have no children, but then that does make it easier to write the stories because you don't have to deal with children. They had enough money to buy this pile that nobody wanted after the war and turn it into a guest house because that was the only way they could make money. And so they're operating a third-rate guest house. And the reason why they have the guests that they do is because basically they have no place else to go. Poirot is there because he's on the trail of a very specialized serial killer. And this is a real serial killer for Agatha Christie. She normally didn't do them. Even in the ABC murders where it looks like It's a serial killer taunting the police. It's not a serial killer at all. It's murder for the same old reason, which is money. But here she has an actual serial killer, but he is not the kind, and again, she does it different, he is not the kind of serial killer who taunts the police. He doesn't want to be noticed. He likes not being noticed. What he does like is watching the suffering of someone in the dock knowing that they killed someone and not sure anymore why they did it. Then he goes on and finds another victim. In the adaptation, there are only three murders listed that our villain is responsible for. In the novel, Poirot tells Hastings there are at least five, and he gives details, but he is sure that there are others as well. He just doesn't know about them. And the only thing that these murders have in common is that our villain has become part of the social set of the murderer and the murder victim. So he's there following the murderer. And at the same time, so he knows that there's there's going to be the murderer is always looking for a new opportunity to hunt for victims. And as soon as Poirot arrives, he can see, courtesy of Dr. Franklin, Judith Hastings and Mrs. Franklin, that love triangle, he sees instantly a possible possibility, especially listening to Judith talk at dinner. You wonder how Captain Hastings and his Cinderella could have possibly produced a daughter like Judith, because she seems completely unlike Hastings in every way. Absolutely unlike him. From what little bit that we saw of his wife, who we met and married after Murder on the Links, I don't know where Judith came from. I really don't. Well, Cinderella was always a modern type of woman. She was always wanting to lean into the future because she was a flapper at the time when flappers were not really popular at the moment. They were just on the cusp. So I I could see she would just fall. And Judith is following the doctor. And if Dr. Franklin believes she could adopt those those beliefs as well, because in the end, she runs off with him to Africa. But she does go as a married woman. Mm-hmm. So she does have that much conventionality in her. So Poirot sees Elizabeth Cole, whom he knows is actually Elizabeth Litchfield, whose sister murdered their jailer father. He sees the trouble that the Luttrells have between them and that it's being exacerbated by our villain. And then he realizes why the Franklins took this particular guest house. And it's because Boyd Carrington, a newly made baronet, is staying there while his nearby mansion is being rebuilt. And he used to have a mad passion for Dr. Franklin's wife, Barbara. He's the only person who calls her Babs. And then, of course, there's the dissolute roué, Major Allerton, who is also there, although we're never given a reason why Allerton is there, but he is. And so Poirot sees many opportunities and he wants to do something about our villain. So he gets Hastings to come out and join him as a bedridden heart patient in a wheelchair. He can't do the detecting that he used to do so he needs hastings to be his eyes and ears and hastings of course is hastings (laughs) hastings is our man hastings and he's dainty i mean he is a really decent man he would never hurt anyone voluntarily unless he truly felt it was necessary and you have to have a darn good reason he is not willfully cruel or malicious ever 
And he wouldn't think about listening at keyholes. Yes, he ha- would not listen at keyholes, which any good detective would do. They're like matchmakers that way. Of course they listen at keyholes. How else are you going to know what's going on? But in the early days of the British government, when we're talking about, say, 1900s to 1910, and the science of espionage was coming into play, that belief prevailed. Gentlemen do not read other They're gentlemen's mail. mail. And I'm sure that there were spy masters around the world who read that and th- rolled their eyes and say, you do you, and while you're being stupid, I'm going to read your mail. Remember, one of the things you should always keep in mind is when your enemies are making mistakes, don't stop them. Don't correct their behavior. <laughs> don't let them know they're doing right. This is a great opportunity for Hastings to have a lot of time doing things. I don't know of any other episode in which she, he appears as something other than Poirot's foil. Oh, no, he did. In Double Clue, when Poirot was being mesmerized by Countess Vera, Mm, uh, Hastings was doing a lot of the uh, investigating. There was another one when Poirot was sick, too. Yes. Covering Um, from influenza. uh, Was that uh, Mystery of the Hunter's Lodge with the uh, gamekeeper Spaniel who knew who the villain was? I know Poirot got sick and was in bed. But there have been occasions when Hastings has been doing the running around. But in this one, he's really doing the running around. But at the same time, like the rest of us, he's slowing down and his mental processes were never super swift to begin with. Now he is definitely a little bit slower, but he's still really a sweetheart. He would be a maddening sweetheart if you uh, if you're really on the ball. But <laughs> they even had that scene where Poirot's in bed and I think he's coughing and, and Hastings is at the end and Poirot's going, water. And Hastings says, no, thanks. I'm not thirsty. It's like, <laughs> For me, you idiot! (laughs) This was a surprisingly funny episode. Even you go into it knowing that you're going to watch David Suchet be Poirot as a dying old man. And he's going to die. He dies in the episode. And you know that you're going to get out the box of Kleenex. And yet you still laugh. It was surprisingly funny. And that was one of them. And usually it's funny because of something Hastings says or does. So the, the, the as the story moves along, there's there's scenes at dinner in which Poirot is able to watch everybody and, and watch. Uh, and Hastings also has scenes with his daughter, Judith. And, and that's something you don't see otherwise. Oh, yes. Once Hastings marries Bella back in Murder on the Links, they go off to Argentina and then you never see the wife again. Apparently they have four children. Judith is the only one you ever meet in Curtin. And Judith is the one that he has the most trouble with because he doesn't understand her at all all she is determined to eventually find fault with anything anything dear old dad says or does because that stuffy old duffer what does he know there's one particular scene in in which she says don't make me hate you any more than i I already do and you go whoa (laughs) judith is one of those people that she really does need to have life slap her upside the head a few times she really needs to be really hurting really sick to have any empathy at all for other people. Judith has virtually no empathy for anybody she doesn't care about. If she doesn't care about you and you aren't performing a useful function for society, well, you shouldn't be walking around, should you? We see this in Barbara Franklin as well, because she's playing the invalid until she decides she doesn't, especially when uh, Sir Sir William is yes, Sir William around. Boyd Carrington. Yes, and why didn't she marry him? Because he was the son of the brother of the baronet, which meant that he had no prospects at the time. And she married Doctor Franklin because she thought he would become a a brilliant scientist, brilliant doctor on Harley Street, social status, and buckets of money. And instead, he turned into a hardcore researcher who wanted to spend all his time in a tent in Africa instead of gracing the salons of London. So mm. she was very very disappointed in her marriage and then she discovers that Boyd Carrington is taking rooms at Styles and that's why the Franklins are there because Babs insisted that she could be close to Boyd Carrington and have a man flirt with her from the past a man devoted to her a man who is now has a title and money It might just be a more casual flirtation at first, but once our villain gets to work on her, our bab starts thinking about, you know, if I was a widow, if my dear doctor died, Boyd would marry me immediately. I'd be a grieving widow and he'd have to take care of me and then I'd be the baroness. I'd be Lady Boyd Carrington and live in the mansion with buckets of money instead of making do in a tent in Africa. 
or in this shabby place where he has room to uh, play with his rats. Yes, in play the with the laboratory his... and the poison around it as well. Exactly. He, he's talking about that too, and that makes it a very convenient. And she actually sets it up very nicely. Christy sets that up with Barbara talking about, "I'm worried about him. He may start experimenting on himself." Yes, and that's so that she can set up the murder of Dr. Franklin. You can just see her at the coroner's inquest with her hand to her forehead, sobbing and weeping. Oh, he experimented on himself. I told him not to. Oh, 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 those dreadful Calabar beans. He was so brave, so selfless, so obsessive about his science. What happened is one of those coincidences is that shooting stars came by. They were all in, in Barbara's room. She had all of she had her set up in place because she also saw a rival for Boyd Carrington, and that was Nurse Craven. Again, remember, nobody ever sees a servant. And so you don't see the nurse. The nurse is wearing her white cap and her uniform and she's her hair is severely pinned back and she is bustling around doing nursely things, taking care of someone who, in, in the nurse's opinion, well, she enjoys being an invalid, doesn't she? But it's a job and it pays. What you don't see is that Nurse Craven is an attractive, buxom, cozy armful. She is young and hot and she notices the men around her. She certainly notices Major Allerton, which you discover later on, and Major Allerton, who can recognize the beauty of a woman past her uniform. What happens is that Babs discovers that Nurse Craven is reading Boyd Carrington's palm. It's a very intimate gesture. She's got his palm close to her face, and she's tracing the lines on his palm with her finger, and it's so... It's so tempting. It's so, it's so tempting. So tempting. And Barbara opens the door and walks in on them, and they guiltily start like, "Oh, oh, oh! You're not meant to see that," which confirms her suspicions. That, oh my God! That woman has eyes for my second husband. Mm -hmm. My and future second husband. My future second husband. <laughs> and so Barbara jumps the gun on her plans. She doesn't have enough time to set up the murder. And then, of course, she invites everybody there for coffee to her room. Everybody goes off to see the shooting stars, and Hastings is frozen in the chair. And he's frozen in the chair because Boyd Carrington looks at Babs. You have to see the shooting stars. Oh, no, I'm perfectly fine here on my little fainting couch. And he snatches her up like the romantic hero he is and carries her into the next room to the window. And Hastings, all he can remember is doing that with his own wife, carrying her into some other room. That's what Judith says. Yes, I was wondering, but he was also kind of thinking about that line from Othello. Yeah, he was trying to work on a crossword puzzle. He was remembering his wife, and then he sees Boyd Carrington do something that he used to do with his own dearly loved Bella, because that's what Judith tells us. And he just can't. He, he is so overcome, and of course, being the kind of man he is, he is not going to weep in front of other people, so he swallows it and turns the table around to get the Shakespeare edition of right. Othello. There's bookshelves on all four sides, so you have to turn the table around, and by turning it 180 degrees, the coffee cups switch. The coffee cups but switch But nobody position. can notice the difference. And there's nobody there to see it. And so when Barbara comes back, Boyd Carrington sets her down on her couch, and she's so comfy, and she says, oh, Franklin, you know, or whatever Dr. Franklin's first name is, you must drink your coffee, and I'll have mine. And she drinks her coffee, and goes to bed and then wakes up in agony because, of course, she drank the poison coffee she meant for him. And so you could say Hastings murdered Mrs. Franklin, but he did it completely by accident. He had no, in, he, he didn't know what was in the coffee cups. Nobody knew what was in the coffee cups except Barbara Franklin and Poirot probably had his suspicions. But once Barbara Franklin died in the middle of the night in agony and it was discovered through the autopsy that it was the Calabar bean, he knew. He knew that it was Barbara doing it because at some point, and this did not come out in the film, at some point, and I cannot remember who it was that Dr. Franklin was talking to, but even though he is a eugenist and a firm believer in getting rid of useless people who do things like grow food and scrub toilets and make sure your power is working, 
he also believes in following through on his vows. And he made vows when he married Barbara, and he is not going to divorce Barbara because it would be the wrong thing to do. He's stuck with her. Because they didn't say that in the film, that meant that at the end, when Barbara's dead and he says, I'm going off to Africa now to do what I have really wanted, which is to go back and do this wonderful research and live in a tent in the jungle surrounded by tsetse flies and parasites of every kind, he's really happy. If they would have included that line that he would not break his vow to Barbara, that gives an even better reason for him to be practically kicking up his heels because he was freed. Her death freed him. He knows it's not suicide. He says that specifically, that he can't believe that it's suicide because she wasn't that kind of person, but he doesn't want to know who did it. And this, again, is where Hastings simply isn't bright enough to see what's going on around him because you can almost bet that Dr. Franklin is thinking, Judith did it. He has heard Judith say sickly people should be gotten rid of. They should be disposed of. They should be, you know, put to death quietly and mercifully. He and Judith have been carrying on a mad passion with each other of longing glances and working next to each other in the lab, but no improprieties whatsoever. It's all unspoken glances and, you know, hot dreams. Now he has his chance. He's free. He can go to Africa. He can marry Judith, but there will always be that doubt. Did she murder my wife? There's also the possibility that Dr. Franklin is bright enough to have noticed that Babs has eyes for Boyd Carrington, and he may be suspicious that she was going to poison him and drank the wrong coffee by mistake. We don't know. And there's also, and again, this was in the text, but not in the film, Nurse Craven very much noticed Dr. Franklin as a handsome, interesting, successful man with a worthless wife, and if the wife died, well, maybe Nurse Craven could become Mrs. Franklin number two. And it's quite possible that Babs was aware of that, as well as seeing Nurse Craven read Boyd Carrington's hands. Babs is not particularly polite or well-mannered with her nurse. You never see a scene where Babs is courteous or friendly to the nurse. The nurse is anybody. very professional. Yeah, she's not with anybody other than Boyd. She comes in from a day of shopping and hands all the packages to Hastings to take up to her room. Because she isn't going to do it. I mean, remember, she's supposed to be an invalid fainting on her couch, but only when it suits her. Now, the one other thing about the book and the adaptation I really appreciate it, and again, this is this shows Christie's inventiveness, is to come up with a villain who doesn't do the murders directly. This is all murder by proxy. So not only does she come up with a serial killer, but a serial killer with a very big psychological kink that leads to this wonderful encounter at the end with Poirot, where Poirot lays it out and you have this battle of psychological wills going on between each oh, other. wonderfully done. That was expanded over what was in the book. Certainly that whole thing about your mother always knew what kind of a twisted little worm you were. That was not in the novel. But it worked beautifully. It worked beautifully because this is Poirot sparring with someone whom he knows to be a killer. Someone who kills, as you say, by proxy. He kills by proxy. Now, Agatha has always had murderers who killed someone and set it up so that someone else took the blame and hung. The, the real murder was the crown executing someone else. Towards Zero is a good example of this because Neville Strange uh, set his first wife up for murder so that he could watch the crown hang her. But our villain here, it's nobody he knows. It's not for uh, the anger game. that you have for your ex-wife or something like that. He moves around casually from place to place. He's got a little money of his own and he moves around casually and looks for suitable subjects and ingratiates himself into the social circle, finds the weaknesses and then urges people to do what they would not actually have done and then he gets to watch not only the grief and remorse as of course as a concerned family friend but the trial and then the crown executing them and it's great he loves it and watching him spar with poirot is fascinating to watch because you don't know what he believes or the whole thing about his mother is it real and then his defenses come back up and says and then laughs at Poirot or was it something that never happened in the first place yeah and you don't know we don't know with someone like that it could be either way you really don't know 
at the end when when he kills Stephen Norton, he does it so well that the police will never suspect him. And Hastings, who does try to poison Allerton because he's such a cad chasing after her dear Judith, and uh, dear Judith needed to be caught by <laughs> Allerton, but she was too smart for him. Hastings wipes all the fingerprints off the bottle, so his fingerprints on it. But then, of course, Major Allerton's fingerprints aren't on the bottle either, which is really suspicious. If he'd worn gloves, he wouldn't have had that problem. <laughs> <laughs> you would have just had some smears. See, this is the important things like that can lead you to be captured by the police. So you got to keep this in mind. That's that's why you have to watch CSI faithfully and religiously in order <laughs> oh, <laughs> if you're going to murder anyone so you can learn what not to do. Now, there was something else we were talking about before we sat down for the podcast. You were getting a different interpretation because you had read that book by the French author about who really killed Roger Ackroyd. And I can't remember the he name of the author or the book. this long thing. This is Pierre Bayard's Who Killed Roger Ackroyd. And this is, I read this book because, of course, it's about Roger Ackroyd. And I'm right, I was writing the notes for it. And, so, and this is for our annotated Roger Ackroyd, by the way. And he was so confident about calling Hastings a murderer because of this incident. And Poirot does as well, although I can't imagine Poirot really believing that Hastings was a murderer for turning the tables and causing the biter to be bit. Yeah, that was completely innocent on the part of Hastings. He had no idea. It was an interesting way for Agatha to make Hastings the murderer or the near murderer. And murderer implies intent and actual agency. This was an accident on Hastings' part. This was not what you would call, not even manslaughter, because there's no knowledge and no intent on his part to do someone in. Now, if he had successfully poisoned Allerton, oh, yeah. that would be different. That was premeditated murder. Oh, no absolutely. question that was premeditated murder. And Poirot saved Hastings from himself. And in the morning, Hastings woke up and thought, what was I doing? What was I thinking? He was just horrified at himself and deeply grateful that Allerton lived to go off and besmirch the reputations of other pretty young maidens. Of But Hastings isn't a murderer. No. Absolutely not. Although, as we saw, he could be driven to it. And that reinforces the kind of the sub theme, sub symbolism. For, that he has, to, he can't wait any longer. Yeah. But it's also the use of Othello that um, Norton is Iago. Yes, the false counselor, the person that you believe, that you trust, that you rely on, the stalwart family friend who encourages you to follow your own worst impulses, but he does it in such a way you don't realize what's happening. Even when you look back on it, it's it it's all so subtle, so casual. You can't say, like with Toby Luttrell, when he shoots Daisy, and they didn't show his remorse and regret, by the way, in the film. He was absolutely horror stricken that he shot Daisy and he missed. He, he shot Daisy, but it wasn't a killing shot. And he's a good enough shot that it should have been a killing shot. And Poirot points out that when it came to pull the trigger, he couldn't make the killing shot because he could have killed her and he didn't. That's a good point. What would happen with Toby Luttrell, even if he had made the killing shot, is he would have been not been able to say at any point, Stephen Norton told me to shoot her because Stephen Norton didn't. What Steve he did was stand off stage and say loud enough, boy, what a weak man. What a wimp. Boy, that wife of his rides roughshod over him. Poor Luttrell. Here he is trying to give us a drink like a gentleman, and that harridan wife treats him like a stupid servant. He At no said. point could Toby Luttrell be able to stay, say, in private or in a court, anything other than, I did it. And there's no way for Poirot to prove any of this as well, because it wasn't solicitation for murder, which is what it would be. If he actually said, you know, you should shoot him here. Here's the gun. Why don't you shoot that? Yeah, absolutely not. It was far more subtle than that. And I think I think Stephen Luttrell makes a great villain, the kind of villain that you do not see coming. And because of the way the novel is written, it really isn't until the end when Hastings receives the letter that you actually realize that it was Stephen Luttrell all along. The movie has to do it a little bit differently, but... Because because you're you're seeing Hastings read the letter and, yeah, it was and four months after Poirot's death, he receives a letter 
the lawyer sends on a letter and they, and Poirot gets the last word. He does yes, the Poirot, Poirot gets the anyway. last word as even, always. Even beyond the grave, he, he still does the Poirot. In fact, I think the only episode we've ever seen where Poirot didn't get the last word was the adventure of the Italian nobleman where the Siamese cat got the last word. <laughs> but that's what they do. It just worked out beautifully and once again she turned the tables on everything you think you know you have a serial killer but he's a very different kind of a serial killer one who kills by proxy and then enjoys the emotion afterwards and you have hastings as an accidental murderer and hastings as a would-be murderer who is foiled by poirot and poirot himself as the executioner and he takes the guilt upon himself to prevent Stephen Norton not just from killing other people by proxy, but he destroyed those families. You see this with Elizabeth Cole. Her family was torn apart, even though their jailer father was dead. The sisters, and you get more of this in the novel, the sisters are just devastated and their emotions are very conflicted they're very grateful that a wicked father is dead who was destroying their lives but at the same time their sister was a murderer and she did it to save them and the guilt must be thick enough to spread on toast this was a very strong ending to this oh, whole yes. series. It was a magnificent ending, and we didn't, I'm actually rather grateful, we didn't really get a Poirot death scene. I mean, he was obviously on his way out when we last saw him. He, was obvi he decided he was going to let himself die. He wasn't going to reach for the ampules when he has his attack. He just reaches for his rosary and goes and with God. And he prays. He prays and he lets God uh, work his ways. There is one thing, though, I don't understand, because he sends... Hastings out of the room and Hastings goes downstairs and encounters Elizabeth Cole playing the Chopin piece, the prelude, which haunts the entire episode. And then he gets a look on his face and rushes out of the room and back up the stairs. What happened there? I think that he realized that Poirot was dead, almost like he had been tapped on the shoulder, that he walked out of the room and realized that Poirot would have a heart attack and would die if he didn't come back up the stairs. And I think what happened is he may have actually felt that brush on the shoulder that says. Very subtle and very evocative. And I could see why he would send Hastings out, because Hastings would try to save him. And yes. Poirot didn't want that. He didn't want that. He was ready to go. And he was ready to go for numerous reasons. He, his body was failing him. He could still walk, as it turns out. But his body was failing him with that kind of a heart trouble. He knew he was going to die. Dr. Franklin, who may be a brilliant medical researcher, still was trained as a doctor, and he recognized that Poirot was going to die. Poirot had done the one thing that he had never done throughout the series that we've never seen him do in his career, which is that he killed someone with his own hands. He executed Stephen Norton. Norton. He took the law into his own hands because it was the only way to prevent this man from ruining families and murdering people. You know, he, he would continue to do it. He would continue to do it until he couldn't any longer. Of the five cases that Poirot described, he didn't murder five people. He murdered more because you have, say, in Margaret Litchfield's case, Margaret Litchfield murders her father. That's murder number one. Margaret Litchfield is hung by the crown. That's murder number two. So you can say that for each of the crimes that Stephen Norton was involved in, you actually had the odds of not just one murder, but two. Because I think in at least one case, they brought to trial, but there wasn't enough to convict the person of murder, and then they committed suicide afterwards. Yeah. So he has more than just the murder by proxy, then he has the murder by the crown. So he is a mass murderer, but again, it's so subtle that the only way that he can be stopped is if Poirot executes him, but Poirot has sworn to always uphold the law. Letting himself die and putting himself at the mercy of God is the only way he can handle it. Right. It's essentially a self-execution. Yes, it is. This is one of the few shows that treats religion and a person's religious belief seriously. Yes, with some degree of seriousness. And when you follow that kind of logic, you follow where the logic takes you. And that's what Poirot does. And it's a really great ending to the whole series. Oh, it is. It is. The series has definitely had its lows. You know, Appointment with Death was 
truly dreadful, as was the murder of Roger Ackroyd. Again, truly dreadful. But most of it was from good to simply outstanding. It was almost always great television. There was always something to really enjoy, and this was a great ending. You'll probably want to have your box of Kleenex handy, but you should still watch it. Even though you know Poirot is going to die, you should still watch it because it is such a great show, and it's a great evidence of what how subtle his mind is that he can recognize a kind of crime that no one else sees and has the strength of character do what needs to be done. And then after that, you can just go back to the first season again, and he's alive. And he's alive! <laughs> <laughs> you can go back to the Clapham Cook. <laughs> and, and enjoy he's alive. him all over again. <laughs> We're still going to be continuing our podcast. We're still, this was a, a long section of Poirot's that we just happened to start the podcast right in the middle of them. But next time, we're going to be going to The Witness for the Prosecution, the 2016 version. By Sarah Phelps. So we're going to have a couple of Sarah Phelps's um, adaptations. adaptations coming up. And then a few other odds and ends. And then we are going to move into the foreign adaptations of Agatha Christie. Yes, folks, Japanese, Chinese, French, French Russian, and even if we can get it, Bollywood. We'll see you next time. This is Bill Peschel. And Teresa. Oh, and oh, and remember, we do a lot of events, so take a look at our website, PeschelPress.com, if you want to meet us and talk about Agatha Christie. We'll be there, and in the meantime, check out our complete annotated series. They're available as well at all, where all good books are sold, online and off. And thank you very much, and we'll see you at the movies. Agatha Christie, She Watched is Teresa Peschel and Bill Peschel. Produced by Bill Peschel. Theme song, Call to Adventure, by Kevin McLeod. New episodes come out every week wherever you stream your content. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can help support us by going to anchor.fm backslash mystery and leaving a five-star rating and review, and by helping to spread the word. To advertise on Mystery She Watched, email peschel at peschelpress.com. All questions and comments can be emailed to Peschel at PeschelPress.com. And thank you for listening.